Hello there, I'm Black Bright, broadcasting out of the UK, and thank you for visiting my channel. If you like what I write, not what I write, but if you like what I do, what I say, how I am, then please subscribe, like, and share. I do like to give information that is not normally available without digging into a lot of different places. So I just try to make things simple for you. For those of you who like reggae, I did my show last night, so you can always catch up on www.mixcloud forward slash lady dash loy and that's for those who like reggae music now let's come to the topic in hand which is the new or the anticipated um, phone passport at the moment we have e-gates uh, automated border control abc as they're known and it's where you just um, have your passport, you scan it, and you walk through. Um, that's how it's supposed to work in principle. Um, so now what they're saying is that they want to have this software which will now allow you to download your passport onto your phone. And so you don't need the hard copy passport. You just need to walk through with the phone and you go through a few basic um, control mechanisms and that's it. Um, I can't imagine that working because when you have, um, you need human intervention for the most part, we still have faulty algorithms, we're still going to have things in the phone that's going to um, flag um, certain people, certain situations, certain nationalities, certain religions. And so people are still going to get pulled over and stopped. Technically, it should work that provided your face is on the passport and it syncs with the face that's on the biometric data, you should be able to walk through and everything should be hunky-dory. No lines, nothing like that. But it's not going to work like that. We all know it's not going to work like that because we have prejudices, we have unconscious bias, and it's the same thing like stereotypes. We have gut instinct. We have all sorts. And regardless of how many people, how you, um, how you use that e-passport, um, the, the 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 powers that be are not going to trust it implicitly. The same way that they have those machines going around checking their luggage, they don't trust the dogs, just in case they've missed something, and they don't trust their scanning systems, just in case they've missed something. The same thing, it will happen with human beings. They will not um, allow the procedure to go through as planned, despite spending millions, because just in case they miss something. So um, this is going to be ra a rather long video because it contains quite a bit of information but it's uh, I want to share with you um, about the e-gates about the e-passport the transition and also um, with um, what's actually on the electronic passport I mean the biometric passport we know we have a passport we don't know the information on it so I'm going to share that with you um, just last week um, two Canadian citizens who were Muslims were prevented from going into the United States and they also had e-passports technically Canadian citizens should just be able to get into the United States no problem but apparently even though they were from no banned countries they were not allowed to come in and I don't know how many of you saw the devils in the detail that that um it's the video I did that actually gave me the most views, actually, because at that point, that was when I started doing these videos and taking them seriously, because I had read the passport and I had realised I knew there was a difference between naturalised citizens and um, citizens born on the soil, but I didn't know what it was. And the difference was who had the right, who had the right to enter the country, who had the right to live in the country, and who had the right to um, work. And 
So when I discovered that I did this video, and that's quite several months ago, but what was interesting is that when I read yesterday in The Record, which is an American newspaper, Trump was saying the same thing about these two Canadian citizens, even though they're Canadian citizens, even though they... Um, are entitled to come into the United States, they do not have a right. It's at the US border's discretion who they allow into the country, which foreign national they allow into the country. So you cannot believe that just because you hold a British passport or a green card or you're traveling from out of the country and you think you're going to visit the United States or the UK, do not assume you can enter that country just because you have the correct documentation. You still do not have a right. You're not entitled. And it's at the border office's discretion, the border official's discretion, to let anybody in who is not an indigenous, who is not born in that country. Everyone else, they can not be allowed entry. So don't get it twisted and think, oh yes, I'm entitled. I've got a British passport. I've got a green card. I have a permanent resident. I am, you know, I'm from one of these um, countries like Canada, Canada, who's a part of the British rule. And, the, and in America, I mean, they're all a part of that those countries that should be wait, have a visa waiver. And yet, these two gentlemen, one was a prominent Guyanese, he was Muslim, but he was from Guyana, prominent person in his field. And the other one was from Iraq. Not Iran's on the travel ban, but not Iraq, but Iraq. But the fact of the matter is, both of them were turned away without a reason. And when the lawyers questioned it, they were told they do not have an automatic right to enter the country. So the, for those of you who haven't seen that video, you just look, um, just Google the devils in the detail. I did go into it at quite, you know, at quite length. And um, yeah, but that's what I wanted to say here. Now, about the e-gates and today's phone, um, e-gates yesterday, today the phone passports. Um, so let me see. The eGate does have cloning risks, they said. Um, apparent, according to Grunwald, CTO of Germany, German security consultancy, DN Systems Enterprise Internet Solutions, what a long name. He claims that the data held on the RFID, um, I've got that written out somewhere. I always kind of night and it goes out of my head radio frequency identity device. I think it's something like that. Anyway, within e-passports can be copied, but that was in 2006, so they probably made some improvements since, since then. He developed a cloning technique, but he believes that the RFID chips are now encrypted, so they're not so easy to clone. Um, they're suggesting that you use the Faraday um envelopes or pockets, you know, to protect your passport so that there's no um, passport readers that can pick up the information. So the thing is, it's all fine them going electronic, but it's always open to hackers. Um, and as we know, the biometrics are flawed because, you know, they tested it on um, middle-aged white men. And so everybody who falls out of that criteria are targeted. So it's fine saying, oh yes, there's going to be a lot of e-passports, people can just walk through. But if you're a person of colour, if you're a female or if you're elderly, you're going to get stopped. And maybe that's why that professor got stopped, because he was of a certain age. But the fact of the matter is, is that the biometrics and the algorithms are flawed. And so, yes, you can go through the e-gate but you could be pulled over just because you're the wrong colour, just because you're the wrong age, just because you're the wrong gender. So that hasn't improved. Um, 
So the biometric chipped passport, you can use automated the automated e-passport gate instead of having it checked by the border customs officer. And would you believe that if you haven't got that biometric chipped passport, the new one with the little triangle, you cannot enter the United States. I don't know how many of you know that. You cannot enter the United States unless you have the new passport. If you've got the old style, the old style passport, you're going to be turned away. And I think it works out to be quite a lot of money to get one, an emergency one. Um, I got this information about basic, you know, just to clarify what these terms are, the e-gates the e is actually automated border control, an automated immigration control system that combines the latest technologies of e-gate hardware and advanced software such as facial recognition and border control software. It provides a fast and secure solution for airports and border authorities as well as a user-friendly experience for travellers and is part of Gemalta's integrated border management solution. Gemalta is one of those organisations who actually provides this service. They've got multi-camera wall, the gate uh, begins processing biometric as soon as the passenger steps in. The cameras are located in the exit door right in front of the passenger. Digital cameras are placed next to cameras, instinctively attracting eyes in the correct direction. The successful image capture, this allows the passenger to pass through the gate intuitively, minimising the risk of human error and associated time loss. What's interesting about that is that it's all designed to let to make you walk in a certain way, look in a certain direction. So you're almost programmed to follow this procedure in order for it to work. Um, the biometric ver verification software, fingerprint, facial recognition, or a combination of both, will with live quality assurance checks and globally recognized matching engines ensures the passenger is the rightful owner of the document and their unique single person detection system identifies intrusion passenger substitution piggybacking and tailgating it also discriminates passengers and luggage in any situation so the camera wall features no motorised systems or mechanical parts, increasing dramatically the mean time before failure rate of an overall solution. So that gives you some idea about the e-gates, how they work. Um, in order to use the e-gates, if you're thinking about using them as opposed to going up to the border guard or the border official, it must have a chipped biometric UK, EU and EEA or Swiss passport. Um, you need to move anything that could obscure your face like sunglasses, hats, scarves, things like that. I don't know about beards, but I guess if you've got a beard in your passport photo, that's fine. Enter gate when green arrow is displayed. Open your e-passport to the biographic and picture page. Place it face down on the reader so it can scan the picture and read key information holding it in place. You need to hold it down in place. I'm going to tell you what that key information is in a moment. Um, look straight at the camera directly in front of you. Stand still until the green light shows it has captured your image successfully. Remove the passport when instructed and then you can exit. What I was wondering is that, you know, where do these photographs go, though? You know, these fo random photographs that they're taking all over the place. Are they going on that police national database? We don't know where these images go. That's the scary thing, I think, because we're all trying to protect ourselves from these facial recognition cameras. But if you're going to travel, forget it. Your face has already been marked. Um... So for me personally, I'll probably go to the border guard, you know, and just get it done that way. It does seem as though it's quicker, but I can't be bothered to be going through that machine, having it pull me over um, just because I'm a female, just because I'm black and just because I'm old. <laughs> the, the three criteria that it doesn't, it doesn't pick up on. So no, 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 I'll just go straight. I'll, t I'll take my chances and go straight to the border guard. 
um, citizens of the US, Australia, Canada, Japan, New Zealand, Singapore and South Korea still have to complete paper landing cards and hand or present it to the border official while passengers from the UK, EU, EEA and Switzerland are able to use biometric passports. Mm, that's interesting. I guess the landing cards are totally different from, you know, that thing that says what you have to declare. Um, I've already said the USA does not accept passengers holding old star passports. E-Gates use facial recognition technology comparing face to the digital image in the passport. There are 264 gates and 15 entry points around the UK. Uh, Caroline Noakes, Minister for Immigration, claims that e-passports provide a safe, secure means of processing low-risk passengers. Now, what are low-risk passengers? That's what I'd like to know. Are they white, young, um, employed? What's a low risk passenger? So that kind of raised a red flag. I didn't look it up. I meant to, but I've just remembered as I've seen this. I wanted to see what the definition of a low risk passenger was, but oh, I can't go and look for that now. Anyway, allowing our highly trained border force officials to focus their efforts on those who seek to abuse or exploit the system and on wider threats. Um, they reckon that since we already have fingerprints logging on our phones, voice recognition with Siri, Cortana, Amazon Echo Dot and Google and Windows 10 um, does the facial recognition. They reckon they're combining all of those elements and they don't see why people have a problem with it um, at the airport because we're doing it anyway. The majority of us are doing that anyway. Um, the face matching at the airport is known as the sing single token travel. That's what, it's, that's what it's known as. So we're looking at a biometric airport. CETA, the company which provides communications and IT infrastructure for the aviation industry, has been trialling various biometric systems and they're pretty much there in terms of readiness, said Stephen Chalice, CETA's head of product development. I'm going to show you a video. I'm going to, well, I'm going to put a video in the link. And as usual, I'll put all the sources for the inspiration of this video. Um, so basically, this new CETA app, which will allow the e-passport, not the e-passport, the phone passport. You're supposed to scan the passport on your phone. You take a selfie. And once matched... That's all you need to do, apparently. And then you, if, you, if you're going on a flight, you just proceed to security. Can't be that easy. We know it can't be that easy. <coughs> OK. What kind of information is stored on that little red book of yours or blue book or whichever uh, biometric passport you have? OK, you've got the document and document type, which is, of course, the passport. You've got the issuing country. You've got the organization that issued the, the um, passport. You've got the name of the holder. These are the basic things. Passport number. Um, there's a system in there that will check the digit and document number of the passport. Your nationality is in there. Your date of birth is in there. There's also a system that would check the date of birth, the sex, male, female. But I don't know what happens now with trans, with trans gender and binary. Um, I don't know what they're doing about that. You've got the date of expiry, valid until date, and you've also got a system in there that checks those digits. And you have an optional date. I'm not sure what that optional date is for expiry. I didn't know you could have an optional date for expiry or valid. And there's a composite check digit and a comp optional data field. I'm not quite sure what they put in there. They've also got encoded identification feed uh, features. Encoded identification features are those we do not know about. It could be maybe a scar on your eye, a tattoo on your left cheek, a missing, no, it can't be a missing tooth because you can get that fixed, but maybe a sleepy eye or maybe it's the stuff like that. I'm not sure what encoded identification features are. It could even be whether or not your religion. It could be, um, it could be, yeah, your religion. 
your nationality, the country, it could be anything like that, but it's encoded. Whatever it is, you don't know what it is. And then you have the displayed identification features, which are those, the ones that we see. We don't see the encoded ones, of course. And there's also encoded security features. Now, I think the encoded identification features might be things like tattoos um, and scars and things like that. But I think the encoded security features might be the religion. And that could be the what, what flares up if you're coming from one of those travel ban countries or the countries that they consider uh, are a national security risk. So I think they might be in the encoded security features. All of this is in that little red book that you have or the whatever colour your passport is, as long as it's biometric. There's also a section that um, says automated border clearance. Um, there's electronic visa, travel records. So it stores all of that information. Absolutely amazing. It's called an MRTD, a machine reader travel document. Um, and there's also additional details, you know, when you put the next of kin um, on there, we do that with our pen after we get our passport. So I'm not quite sure how they check that. Oh, I think when you, oh, I think when you do the application, you put your next of kin on there. I think that's how you do it. And then when you get the hard copy, you probably write it in because the additional details of the next of kin Apart from the name and address, etc., they also find out the profession, their title. They have a personal summary of that person, which is information we haven't given them. They also ascertain the proof of citizenship. So they're checking that out. There's also custody information. So they're checking that out. Have that, has that person who you've put down as an extra kin got any previous criminal records? You wouldn't think that when you're just putting down next to kin and sticking down your sister, your mother, your brother or whoever, that they're checking out all these all this information behind the scenes. Other valid travel, travel sorry, other valid tra travel documents. Sometimes I'm thinking about onomatopoeia. I'm just going over, you know, swallowing my tongue. Um, <clears throat> so they're probably ascertaining whether that person is legal or not legal or if they are legal whether they're within their visa requirements endorsements and observations so they're looking at that and if you're in america whether you've paid your exit tax <laughs> dread in a babylon anyway yeah so they check that and are any other pe other people included you might not have just put one next to you might put two or you might have children on there i don't know but anyway those are all the features on that little book okay um what else have we got here oh yeah i did mention about the two canadians um that were not allowed the two men who were denied entry at different border crossings and were not traveling together are among at least six canadian muslim men who have been denied entry at the u.s border over the last two weeks um, neither, hold on, the men and their families, all of whom are Canadian citizens, were given little in the way of explanation by border officials for the decision to deem them inadmissible. Neither Guyana nor Iraq are among the seven Muslim majority countries subject to US President Donald Trump's Muslim ban executive order, which essentially blocks refugees and visitors from these countries entering the US. Both men were told to apply for visas at the US consulate in Toronto before returning to the border to seek entry. An unusual process for people who hold Canadian passports. So they've already got to America, at least it's not that far, but they've got to now go back to Canada and do all of this stuff. And because they were going for a wedding, one of them was going for a wedding, they need to do that pretty quickly. I understood it cost him nearly two grand, which he wasn't expecting to pay. Um, The six men, so these six Muslim men, are represented by the Toronto area immigration firm CILF, Caruso, Guberman, Appleby, 
lawyers. They say that if they're seeing this level of activity at their law firm, there may be many other Canadian nationals facing similar problems at the border. And it just won't be Canadian nationals, it'll be indiscriminate. Um, when asked if there has been a new directive in recent weeks with respect to Muslim tra travellers from Canada, a spokesperson for US Customs and Border Protection said the agency has not had any new policy changes. <sighs> No Canadian, this is what I was saying in that video, I was talking about the passport video. No Canadian citizen has a right to enter the US. Entry happens at the sole discretion of the US customs officers on duty. And they have a lot of latitude to ask questions to determine the admissibility of a foreign national. So when they're stopping you and they're taking away your British passport and they're taking away this and people say, them can't do that. They can't take away my passport. They can't take away my green card. They can't do... They can. You don't have a right. And the thing is, like I've said in previous videos, people think I exaggerate. I'm so glad I saw this. Because when I was putting it in there before, people were kind of mocking me. But, see it there? Anyway, um, CBP, which is the Customs Border um, Patrol, lists more than 60 grounds. Yeah, Customs Border Protection, sorry. Lists more than 60 grounds for inadmissibility, divided into several major categories, including health-related reasons, so you can't come over here with the lurgy, Criminality, you can't have a criminal offence. Security reasons, well, that's open, isn't it, really? Illegal entry, well, that goes without saying. Immigration violations, that goes without saying. And documentation requirements, that's an open book. Um, two of the six men denied entry have agreed to share their stories with CBC News to warn other Muslim Canadians about the complications that may arise when traveling to the US. And lastly, I'm coming to the end, um, just a little bit on about the phone passport, which is not in, in force now, but it's in the works. Um, each passenger can send passport and flight data prior to arrival to border control system, then follows the face matching of one couple hundred flight ABC gates and system. We'll give pass through if controls the passport data. Okay, I've got, it's kind of a bit mixed up here. But anyway, what's supposed to happen with the, pho the phone passport is each passport can send a passport and flight details passport and flight detail, data prior to arrival to the port border control system. So, you know, like when you do things online, you just put your passport information and you put your um, flight details. And then uh, when you go through the gates, the automated border control gates, the, syst the system will give pass through if the controls of the passport data and biometric succeeded. There's no physical passport required. That's what will happen when you have the phones. You won't need the physical passports. Um, basics of the virtual passport concept, no physical documents. Identification process requires online connection to issuer. Passport owner has control over virtual passport data. Um, in identification doesn't require additional data sources, i.e. flight data, etc. Identification can be done also by non-governmental organisations. The cost of identification endpoint end can't be prohibitive. First and most important aspects is control over passport data, how a person grants access to passport data. There are only a few possible methods and their combination, something you have passport ID card, 
something you are biometrics something you know questions and answers and passwords actually they were saying that um you know like if you know somebody like my old man now i would look at his face and I recognize him, or if I hear him on the phone, I recognize his voice. They reckon that we're actually conducting biometric matching at that point, which is quite interesting. I never thought of it like that. Um, if there are no physical documents in place, only two last methods will be available. And if we take into account the password and the PIN, I guess that's it. I don't know where the rest of that is, actually. Um, oh, without something you have, can't be considered a secure method. So let me just read that again, because I garbled it a bit. And it's only one paragraph. So the first and most important aspect of, is control over passport data. How passport, uh, how person grants access to the... Uh, First and most important aspect is control over passport data. How persons grant access to per passport data. There are only a few possible methods and their combinations. Something you have, which is the passport or an ID card. Something you are, which is your biometrics, the way you look, the way you sound, your eyes and all that stuff. Something you know, Questions and answers, that is like your password. If there are no physical documents in place, only the two last methods will be available. If we take into account password and PIN, without something you have, it cannot be considered to be a secure method. So, they're trying to build a concept using pure biometrical grants. So I hope you found that useful. I'm so, sorry it went on for so long. But yeah, so we're moving from the e-gates. I haven't even used the e-gates before, to be honest. I just feel much better talking to a person, having that person look at me, check, check everything out, and I go through. I wouldn't want to go through one of those gates and it misidentifies me and goodness knows what else. The alarms go off and they pull me aside. I can't deal with that. Let me deal with a human being for as long as I can. And that's all for now. Bye bye.